Most of us live in cities, and although they can be brilliant places to live and work, they are also extremely wasteful and polluting. In fact, they are the source of around 75% of the world's carbon emissions. So, is there a better, more environmentally friendly way to run a city? Amsterdam has kind of a crazy, wild ambition to become the world's first circular city. Well, it means that the city hopes by 2050 to use no fresh virgin materials and to recycle all its waste so that it produces no waste. It also wants to have halved its use of raw materials by 2030, which of course is only five years away. So that's a, a really big challenge and I've come here to see a few of the projects that people around the city are working on to try and reach that really ambitious goal. If you want to become a circular city, you have to know where to start. You have to know where the biggest impact uh, is. So where's the highest material throughput? Where do you consume a lot of materials? Where's the highest environmental impact? About five, six years ago, Amsterdam started working on a circular monitor to track the material consumption in the city and the material throughput and the waste that they produce. And actually the picture is kind of clear. It's buildings, roads, food, electronics that create the biggest impact. Uh, so there's our priority list. With those priorities in mind, my first stop was to look at the built environment. The city government of Amsterdam has calculated that it uses about 300,000 tonnes of materials per year just building and repairing roads, pavements and cycle paths. I've come here to what used to be an old bus station and is now a place where they're taking old, kind of slightly misshapen bricks and they're training a robot to be able to stack them up so that they can be used more easily to maintain the roads here. Rob, thanks for showing me around. We're going to have a look at the robot that you're using to pave some of the streets in Amsterdam. Yeah. Would you show me? Yeah, ja, graag. Come verder. Uh, what you here see is uh, the stenen die uh, worden aangeleverd vanuit projecten uit Amsterdam. Die worden losgestort in allerlei bunkers. En die komen dan uiteindelijk worden ze hier zat in de robot gegooid. En deze mensen die hier staan, het eerste wat zij doen is een visuele controle van de stenen. Dus is de steen beschadigd, is hij te groot, is hij een andere kleur, is het een andere soort? Die filteren hun hier al meteen uit. Alle foute stenen gooien we apart en die gaan dan uiteindelijk naar de afval. They make new stones of it. They crush it and there is an ingredient for a new product. En op het moment dat hij goed is, gaat hij hier door. So these ones are reused and if you can't reuse it, then it's recycled. Yeah. We did a life cycle assessment and we are basically asking the question how much CO2 is emitted for one square meter of bricks to be produced. And to summarize the, the main results, whatever we have in the road right now is already basically emissions that were emitted and that is, that is already there, right? That's what we want to use. We have developed one clam for it, so we can lay all bricks. Not every clam can lay all bricks. This is so uh, different in size, height, uh, length, uh, so you have to have a special clam. This is a vierkante meter, dus als één vierkante meter per keer wordt die teruggelegd in de straat. Dat is ook meteen arbotechnisch waar we naartoe willen. Het niet meer handmatig leggen van stenen. When, when you do it by hand, 100, 100 to 200 square meters a day. And with a machine, you can easily double it. Ja, and then, ja, je, dan is het op zich heel erg makkelijk. Dus je ontlast de stad er eigenlijk mee. Waste is human invention. We should reuse to the maximum because we want to have a lower footprint, but also we want to have a more sustainable business model. Raw materials, even the materials that are cheap today, will become expensive in the future. So it doesn't make sense to have good quality of materials, throw them away and not reuse them just because they are used before. But it's not just bricks that make up the built environment. There are also some much more modern pieces of technology that inevitably end up reaching the end of their working lives. 
it turns out that solar panels can have a really significant impact. So I've come to speak to some of the researchers to find out more. Some of the strategies that, that we're focusing on here in Amsterdam is partially lifetime extensions. And then one of the more high-end R strategies would be high quality recycling and repair. We are working on a project called Fair PV uh, with Biosphere Solar, Circularize and Research Departments at the TU Delft. And we're developing a repairable, transparent and sustainable solar panel. What are we looking at here? What, what is this exactly? It's obviously a solar panel, but what, what's special about it? It's a solar panel that has a one big difference, which is that it is not uh, glued together. So solar okay. panels have this lamination, which means that they are just one uh, big piece of material um, and you can't separate anything. Uh, what we do is we only uh, close it around the edges, which means that what we'll do in a second is open it with a hot knife and you have all of your components right there. We see potential to actually use the materials for new solar panels, um, which is quite hard to do because uh, silicon has to be, I think, 99.9999999999% pure. <laughs> so if you've got glue and all these things and it's really hard to disassemble, then um, yeah. you won't reach that purity. Yeah. Currently, solar panels, they're rather downcycled. The aluminium frame can be removed. Uh, the glass can be uh, recycled in a low quality, but also the, the very uh, critical components so, such as the, the silicon cells and the silver within it, it can only be, or it is only shredded and used as filler material for asphalt or concrete. So this is the, uh, the operating table. <laughs> <laughs> You have this adhesive around the outside, and then I can see obviously these silicon um, photovoltaic wafers. Yeah. Is that all there is to it, or is there more to it than that? So the glue also ensured that it sticks together, right? That everything stays in place. So you see these little dots here? Yeah. This can all be removed once heated a little so bit. So just using a smaller amount of adhesive? Yeah. We're developing a machine to do this industrially. So this is really just to kind of show the, the proof of concept. All of these cells are set in uh, strings and what we would do is we would choose either a part of the strings or take the entire string and replace it with the one we showed in the box. These cells can then be recycled properly and new high functioning cells can be installed again in this solar panel. In this energy transition and circular transition, we are basically transforming a whole city. So a lot of new innovations will be used. And this also poses new uh, challenges that we may not have encountered before. And I think what they're doing here very well is we're looking proactively in what kind of challenges these are and how can we proactively uh, solve them. Some of the actions we need to take to make a city circular require everyday people to get on board. And that includes tackling food waste. On average, it's about half a kilo of food waste per day per family. I went to see one simple technology that is being installed in Amsterdam's newly built flats and could one day be in all our homes. So what, what am I looking at here? What this machine does is it dewaters the ground up food waste uh, that we produce on the platform here upstairs. You have a normal sink and then next to it you have a smaller sink with the kitchen sink grinder unit. So all the, the, the ground up food waste that you can see in the plumbing right here, uh, essentially it flows down and then it winds up here on the other side in this big machine. Am I right in thinking that normally food waste or as a standard, the basic thing you can do with it is just incinerate it and that produces energy. Yeah. But there are potentially other things, smarter things you can do with the waste as well. So you can imagine we're gonna make compost or biogas or uh, products like this. Okay. But we're also aiming for higher applications. So for example, uh, the, the building blocks of bioplastics. The water is actually a problem in the whole collection system. We first have to, let's say, remove the water, which all costs energy. And that's the whole research about how to use as less water as possible, and once we use it, how to, to extract, let's say, the food waste from the water again. And uh, after this project, we also look at how to extract the nutrients that are solved into the water, because there will also be a lot of nutrients in the water, fraction, and what can we do with that? The, the, the first step is this uh, dewatering step. This is a screen deck. 
You see, oh, yeah. so the water falls through. So it's and then just the, starting. Yeah, and then the solid component <clears throat> kind of slides down uh, to the next separator step. Okay. A screw here that transports the solids that fall down in it this. It pushes them up. It pushes it like up. Like an Archimedes screw. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. The, the idea is if the foot waste gets pressed off here, pressure is built, and you kind of like if you if you clean if you dry a towel, you know, it's like that you press ringing, it out, ringing same happens here, yeah. yeah, and then it falls down in this container. Amsterdam has a schedule of seventy-five thousand apartments until two thousand fifty, new to be built. That will be mostly high-rise buildings, and they all can be connected to such a system. But there is another type of waste that can be more challenging to deal with, especially when it gets into our waterways. I'm standing here on one of Amsterdam's canals. This is actually one of seven points in the city where water flows out towards the sea. And just in front of me here is the city centre and the central railway station as well. And of course, there's an awful lot of rubbish flowing out in the water from the city centre. And this is where it's collected. What we've seen and what the science tells us is that cities are one of the major sources worldwide of the ocean plastics that we are also worried about. So what we try to do with the municipality is make sure that we catch it before it enters the river here and then enters the sea. There's all sorts of nonsense in here. There's cups, um, fast food containers, um, glass bottles, plastic bottles. There's even some things that I won't mention related to the city's red light district. Um, but all of it's being collected here, and I've come to find out how this device works. What you see over here is a combination of a curtain, so a floating line, in combination with a catching system. Uh, and the curtain drives the plastic towards the system. The whole curtain makes it impossible for the trash to go out of the city. Yeah. So the curtain needs to be deep enough in the water. So in this case, it's uh, 50 centimeters. And also you, what you see is it's 20 centimeters uh, on top of the, uh, the surface of the water. So it's that the, the trash is not going over the curtain. Yes. Uh, and that's all based on water current yes. and uh, wind. So the idea is that the, the, the rubbish kind of flows down the curtain and ends up is it this is this what we're standing on is the where we're standing on is, is, is the catcher could we have a little look at what what the catch is the system was emptied yesterday oh, this so this is just a day's worth of plastic yeah do you, you see a light, even a light bulb in there bottles uh, fast food fast drinks what is that i think that one is for a flag for a flag like a flagpole it looks yeah. like yeah yeah you could be right the plastic that we catch in the catching systems, the most important thing that we do with it directly is tag it, categorize it, number it, um, create data points out of it. And, and we use that data to design preventive policies and to target the items that cause the most nuisance to solve the problem. Is it the case now that for Amsterdam as a whole, you're trying to trap like the, all of the plastic exiting it? So you need to take a look at the bottlenecks the places where you can make the biggest impact. The biggest impact. You know? And the money that you put into removal could also be put in prevention. Yeah. Then you prevent those plastics because that, that, this bottle is one bottle, but if it's broken down, at the end, it is a thousand or a million microplastics. Yes. And, and try to remove those plastics in a cost-effective way. That's, that's impossible. This gives insight in type of plastic, how much, and and you stop the journey. That's great, thank you. We like to view Amsterdam as a living lab where we try all kinds of new things that haven't been tried before. We show how it works, we write the lessons down, and then other cities can uh, replicate it. We hope it will uh, also help to establish a different culture, a different consumption culture, in which we care about our materials and our resources and our landscapes and environments much more, and work together to nourish and maintain our own environment. What I've been really struck by today was just that sense that you won't make a city circular by just a top-down diktat. It's got to be communities and researchers and policy makers kind of all working together. And also just how difficult it is, like all the work that's gone on so far, important as it is, it's still really just a small part of the, of the jigsaw. So yeah, it's still a long way to go.